Greetings, APER scholars, for our review on Unit 5, Andrew Jackson and Reform Movements, looking at the review sheet from top to bottom. The election of 1824 and the corrupt bargain. In 1824, Jackson is going to receive the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, but you need a majority of the electoral votes to be president. So the Constitution says what happens in this situation, the election goes to the House of Representatives, which must pick between the top three vote-getters. And this is Jackson in first place, second place is John Quincy Adams, and third place is Henry Clay. Now, Henry Clay is going to throw his support behind John Quincy Adams, who in return is going to make Clay the Secretary of State. And this is the corrupt deal, the corrupt bargain. And and Jackson's followers see this as a stolen election. In 1828, Jackson will win a clear electoral majority. He will win the president in the next go-round in 1828. And this is seen as a symbol of the victory of the common man, the first Westerner, a victory of, of the, um, the regular guy against the East Coast elite. And democracy is going to be increasing during this time period, not because of anything specifically that Jackson does, but Jackson, during this time period, most states are dropping the property requirement, which means the common man has more access to the ballot box. The number of white voters will double in this time period. But keep in mind here that there are those who aren't voting, such as slaves. Slavery is increasing as slavery is pushing west. You have women aren't voting. And you certainly have discrimination against the increasing Catholic population, especially along the East Coast. Other things that are indications of greater democracy, you have increased newspaper circulation, you have the disestablishment of state churches, you have direct nominating conventions for um, party candidates, you have direct election of electors, and you have more elected positions in government are replacing appointed positions. Jackson is going to, with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, this would be during, um, this would be after his 1828 election, he is going to, later Martin Van Buren after him, are going to be removing Indians from basically the southeast. These are going to be Choctaw and Creek and more famously the Cherokee Indians are going to be uh, evicted and moved by the army across the Mississippi to what's called Indian Territory, which is future Oklahoma. And probably the best known eviction is the Trail of Tears. About 16,000 Indians forcibly moved, marched west, and about 4,000 of them will die of malnutrition, of disease, and exposure. And what's going on here, um, one of these situations is in Georgia they've discovered gold on Cherokee Indian land. Georgia has um, canceled the self-government and the possession of this land by the Cherokees. Cherokees go to the Supreme Court and they sue in Worcester versus Georgia. They sue and they win. They win and the, the Supreme Court says that Georgia cannot cancel a treaty the Indians made with the national government. That the federal government's treaty is going to um, is going to you know, supersede, is going to trump any um, any um, law that Georgia makes and that Georgia can't do this. Georgia can't interfere with the national government. Jackson will ignore this and march the Indians west anyways. 1831, you have a famous slave rebellion under Nat Turner. He is a black slave, never caused any trouble, a preacher who's going to go on a rampage with um, some followers and kill about 60 whites. And this is going to spread fear across the South. It's going to cause a tightening of what are called slave codes that you can't travel without a pass, without permission. You can't be off the plantation, certainly, without um, your master's okay. And there's going to be restrictions on meeting, on worshiping, on possession of, you know, things like guns or possession of um, any sort of instrument like a trumpet or a drum that might be an, um, a call for you know, signaling a rebellion. And this precedes the 1832 nullification crisis. South Carolina is going to reject this tariff, which they call the Tariff of Abominations. It's an import tax, which they say gives preference to the eastern seaboard elite and their factories and a class of factory workers at the expense of southern farmers and plantation owners who have to pay this tax on more expensive American goods because imports are, are more costly. And 
John C. Calhoun, a one-time vice president under, under Jackson, is going to um, lead the South Carolinians in this protest, and he's got a, a document, he's got an essay called Exposition and Protest, in which he says a state can nullify a national law, and this is what South Carolina does, it refuses to collect this tariff. And Jackson is going to threaten to invade South Carolina, and he says he's going to hang the first rubble from the first street lamp, and he's referring to John C. Calhoun. The Congress will give Jackson the right to invade with the force bill, but the, the Congress has a, a, a carrot to balance the stick, and they're going to agree to reduce the tariff, so South Carolina will repeal this act of nullification and things will cool down. And keep in mind here, South Carolina, just a little bit before this, there's been this horrible rebellion um, from a southern perspective by Nat Turner. So if the North, which is, which is increasing in population and can force this tariff down the throats of the southern people against their will, um, the danger is here is that the North can reach in and mess with slavery. And you do have a very vocal, very loud abolitionist ma uh, minority who are arguing that slavery is an abomination itself. It's not the tariff, but it's, it's, it's slavery. And you have a number of abolitionists. Some are um, arguing for a gradual or compensated emancipation. Some are arguing to send slaves back to Africa, such as the American Colonization Society that will settle Liberia. But guys like William Lloyd Garrison in his newspaper, The Liberator, is going to argue that slavery is just flat out evil and there needs to be immediate emancipation. And Garrison is going to argue that slavery is a pact with the, de with the Constitution itself, which um, protects slavery, is going to be a pact in the bowels of hell with Satan himself. And he's not popular in the North. He's going to tear up copies of the Constitution and he's going to be sort of driven out of town by northern audiences, and how much less is he appreciated in the South for um, you know, stirring up um, the slaves. Frederick Douglass is one of the leading black abolitionists. He's a runaway from Maryland, writes a famous autobiography, and he is going to be the publisher of the North Star newspaper, which is an abolitionist um, newspaper. The uh, transcendentalism is going to be an American version of romanticism, and transcendentalism is going to focus on the individual as opposed to the community, is going to focus on feeling instead of reason, is going to focus on the countryside instead of the city. And this fits the tenor, the mood of the time, that within, everything's possible for, for the individual. This is a time of increasing success and achievement and possibility and potential for the little guy to make it. Jackson is this very powerful symbol. He's the first poor man who made it out of a cabin from immigrant parents into the White House. And transcendentalism is focusing on um, the individual. There's this famous book, um, collection of poems by Walt Whitman called Song of Myself. I mean, it's you know, sort of egocentric here. You also have Henry David Thoreau's Walden. This, um, this writer is going to live over a year in a cabin on Walden Pond, and he's going to talk about marching to the beat a very different drummer. He's going to talk about contemplating nature and living in the woods versus civilization. You have this whole school of art called the Hudson River School of Art, which is going to focus on landscapes, but they're country landscapes, places where you know the air is clean and the water is pure and a person can think about things that are, are, are right rather than the city and the congestion of the growing slums and industrial workplace. You look at paintings of waterfalls and mountains and, and forests and ponds and, and lakes and things like that. Back to Jackson. Um, Jackson and the Bank of the United States. Jackson is an opponent of the bank. He says it's a plot by the rich against the poor. He says it's unconstitutional. He will veto a rechartering of the bank and he's going to accelerate the demise of this bank by pulling money out and putting it into state banks. And these state banks are nicknamed by his opponents pet banks. Now, the Bank of the United States had limited credit, had limited the money that's in circulation, and this keeps inflation down. Not so when the bank is dead, money's in the pet banks, money is, um, credit is, is increased, people are borrowing money, buying land, there's a real estate boom as people are moving west, and they're paying the government an increasingly inflated paper money. And Jackson is going to demand payment in gold and silver with what's called the specie circulator. And it's been argued that he single-handedly causes an economic collapse. This probably would have come anyhow, 
but he pulls a rug from underneath the economy as people don't have this money to pay for land purchases. And the Panic of 1837 will be the result. This is what we would call a depression today. About half the banks collapse. A good chunk of American industry is, um, is idle. Lots of unemployment, especially seen in the larger urban areas that are growing on the East Coast. And this is going to be landed in the lap of the successor of Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and the Whig party is going to win the next election. The Whigs are a brand new party. They're an anti-Jackson party. The Whigs are, you might think of them as the replacement party for the Federalists. They are a loose construction party. They are for a bank. They are for building of roads and canals, and they are for an active government, and they are for things like the tariff and for um, commerce and for trade and for industry and for factories. And remember Jackson, um, he is going, for example, one of the things he does in his trying to rein government in as a Jeffersonian, as a person who believes in limited government, he's going to veto the Maysville Road in Kentucky. This is a road that has permission from the U.S. government to build this road across Kentucky. And Jackson's feeling is build your own road. He um, vetoes this expenditure as being unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Remember, Jefferson believed in a limited government, strict construction. And you see this debate over what, you know, what is the United States? Is it a compact between the states or is it a, comp is it a deal between the people? And Daniel Webster in a debate over um, Western land sales is the really the topic that doesn't have anything to do so much with the debate itself. Um, it becomes a debate over th this nature of union. And Webster says the union is by the people. Haynes, who's a South Carolinian in the vein of John C. Calhoun, says that the union is a compact between the states. It's not the people, but the states that made the union. And the states can um, say what is um, enforceable in their borders concerning laws from the federal government. The Second Great Awakening is a religious revival that takes place in the 1820s through 1840s. And it is very much a free will religious revival to, distinct from the First Great Awakening, which emphasizes Calvinism and God's sovereignty and God's election and God's judgment. The Second Great Awakening is much more, the theological term is Arminian, not Arminian, but Arminian means you, you have the freedom to say yes to God, to in a sense save yourself by um, receiving salvation. And the Second Great Awakening is very optimistic. It's very full of um, this feeling of the potential that you can be saved and you can live a righteous life and you can pursue re reform, this kingdom that God is um, um, calling on believers to build, think of City on a Hill and John Winthrop, is the Christian's birthright, is the Christian's duty. And there's a whole bunch of these reform movements that flow out of this optimism, out of this um, feeling that, you know, anything's possible now. The little guy is voting. The little guy is making the White House. The little guy is moving and filling up this, this increasingly diverse and broad country. And you have abolition is a, one of these movements to rid the country of the stain of slavery. You have the Seneca Falls Convention in upstate New York, 1848, and the issue of women's suffrage. You have the Declaration of Sentiments will be passed by these women. Some of the more important leaders are Carrie Catt, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott, and the Declaration will be modeled on the Declaration of Independence, and it will be a list of complaints against men who don't let women vote and don't let them work and don't let them study and have these double standards and keep them out of gainful, um, gainful means of employment. And they're ahead of their time. These women suffragists, this will eventually pay off in the 19th Amendment in the 20th century. But these are the things reformers are pushing for, for women to vote, for abolitionism. Horace Mann will be pushing for public schools, and Massachusetts will be the first state with public schools for little kids in particular, poor kids and immigrant kids. And the thinking here is let's get these kids um, assimilated into, into America. Let's teach patriotism. Let's teach the Constitution and the Christian religion and morality. You've got Thomas Gallaudet in schools for the, um, the, the deaf and the mute. You have Dorothea Dix, who is opening up insane, well, she's inspiring legislatures to take the mentally, physically handicapped out of jails and prisons and put them, putting them in insane asylums, safe places. 
you have the temperance movement, which is a movement against alcohol, against um, the abuse of alcohol, later becomes prohibition, which is the ban on the production and sale of alcohol. In 1851, Maine becomes the first state to ban alcohol. You have utopian movements. These are Christian movements, and some of these are you know, within orthodoxy, but many of them are not. You have George Rapp and the Rappites in Missouri setting up a, a communal living experience where people are living together and they're sharing their income. This collapses. You have the Amana community, these German pietists living communally out in Iowa. You have the Oneida community, which becomes a free love community with complex marriage. In upstate New York, you have the Shakers following Ann Lee, who is a self um, she declares herself to be the second coming of Christ in female form, and she's got the celibate a group of followers who, again, are living communi communally and sharing their, their working together and sharing their wealth. And you have these new religious denominations. The Baptists and the Methodists are spreading across the country. You've got um, William Miller and the, the Millerites. He teaches that Christ is coming back in 1844, which um, doesn't happen. But you've got a lot of these groups, and the one that is one of the most quintessentially American that teaches that Jesus came to preach to the Indians, who are descendants of the one of the lost tribes of Israel, who comes over to America on presumably boats, um, way way back long ago, um, are, is, are the the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and Joseph Smith is um, is teaching this message that he was called to be a prophet to restore the fallen the Church of Christ. This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And he's going to lead followers um, increasingly west through um, Ohio and into Illinois and Missouri, or Missouri and Illinois. And he's going to be martyred. He's going to be killed. And largely over this unpopular among the neighbors, uh, this doctrine of polygamy, which is the doctrine of celestial marriage. And he's going to have 28 wives. Um, the, the Mormons are going to follow his successor, Brigham Young, out to Utah in what's called the Great Trek. They're going to find a safe place, sort of an asylum or a, a safe haven on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. They're going to build farms, irrigating them with water from um, the Rocky Mountains. And um, Brigham Young has 55 uh, wives, and but this is their, the Mormons are teaching that they're the restored Church of Christ. And... Book of Mormon is teaching about this, um, you know, the message of Christ to, to the, um, to the original inhabitants of America who preceded the, the settlers at Jamestown and Massachusetts. Um, keep in, some other things here. I was um, bouncing around a little bit on the review sheet. Um, one name to know regarding the Second Great Awakening is Charles Finney. Charles Finney is going to introduce the altar call, and the Second Great Awakening. One of the characteristics of Finney's revivals is they're very emotional, they're very theatrical, they're very melodramatic, and you have um, this call on people's emotions to repent. And this all fits with this idea of romanticism and uh, transcendentalism. This is, this is a period that focuses on the individual, the individual's heart, the individual's um, political power, the individual's religious duty, and the, just the amazement of, of being a human being as far as transcendentalism goes and the focus on on feeling and emotion and uh, self-actualization would be a modern term. So just some thoughts here on this unit and the next one we'll be springboarding into the um, causes of the Civil War. But signing out, 